Is there any more oxygen left in this big Treasury sell-off we've seen this week? I think so. I think the trend could continue next week, right? Rates could continue to go up. We've seen rate volatility has been high this year, and nothing's going to stop that. Krishna, you agree with that? Well, so I think uh, it really depends on what your investment horizon is. So the market sell-off has been significant. I think by year end, we probably get close to 2%, but it is going higher from that. I think next year, because of lots of factors, one, Fed balance sheet is expanding, global reacceleration, and the fact that uh, the overall issuance in the marketplace is going to be significant, I think all of that combines for it, rates to be higher rather than lower. You didn't mention trade. Why not? Well, so I think trade was an issue for early part of 2019. It is not a relevant issue for, for, for the future as long as we don't get exacerbation of the trade issue. I think if we resolve the trade issue, it actually helps the economy, but very modestly. So one way or the other, I don't think trade is a driver at the moment, and it is unlikely to be a driver in 2020. This point in this debate, I think, is critical for this bond market move to continue or not. To what degree is this move through the last week, the last couple of months, about signs of a global economy bottoming out, or about the trade story? Story and the prospect for a trade truce and how independent is one from the other? So we have kind of crossed signals at multiple times in, in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, kind of uh, rally. I, I think the key here is global trade, uh, the impact of that on the economy is actually relatively modest in the near term. From a longer term perspective, it's very important, but the impact on real growth and revival of growth is actually modest. So it, it's not trade, it's the reacceleration that is already unfolding because of the central bank pivot. Robert Tip. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the, the weakness in the economic data and the downturn, it's been a lot more secular. It's actually not been that much re as a result of the trade. And so I think the starting point, you know, when I look around, are, are we getting a bounce? Are we going to get improvement? I mean, I hope so. Could the sell-off go a little bit further in the short term? You can never, you know, it's very difficult to handicap that. But when I look at the starting point, I think that's the thing that is going to anchor us. And I mean, industrial production at Europe, and it is the good side, is at recessionary levels. Industrial production in the United States is down at zero year over year. So even though we're having decent service growth, decent job growth, on the good side, you're stagnating. And I think that's an environment where you're in the right zip code for rates. You're not going to change upwards. Sam, take us one step further. Is this a trade-dependent sell-off? Krishna says, no, your view. I disagree. I do think it's dependent on trade issues. Trade issues, this idea of a trade resolution, this is a moving target, right? So we can say the data might be bottoming, it might not. But that being said, you know, one week doesn't make a trend. And right here, right now, this week, this has been completely induced by trade tensions looking like they're, you know, moving. In the other I would market. also go one step further, Krishna. I would suggest that actually something interesting has happened. The way investors and their attitude have changed towards the trade news. On a day when you get so-called perceived negative trade news, the Treasury market rally is a whole lot smaller than the Treasury market sell-off you get from when the trade news is perceived to be positive. There you go. The, that's a that's proof point in terms of what the driver of the market is. I think the overall reacceleration of the global economy, bottom, everything bottoming out in the third quarter is the key theme. And trade makes for small gyrations around it. It's not the core issue. The core issue is really reacceleration, or at least bottoming out reacceleration that is going to take place over the next few quarters. So the next stage of this conversation needs to go to the correlation, the positive correlation that we may re established between Treasury's rates and risk assets. At the moment, there's been a negative, co negative correlation. Risk assets perform well, Treasury's come lower. Do you see that continuing, or do you see the Treasury market becoming somewhat self-limiting with this sell-off, that it starts to impact risk assets elsewhere? Actually, that's a, that's a very critical point, and I think for that, to, uh, at least to answer that, I go back to what, the, uh, what Jay Powell said in his press conference, which seems like eons ago. They are not going to be even consider raising rates until they see persistent inflation, which means never. So effectively, the, the upside in rates is actually capped out. So I think the, the correlation can continue for a while. After a while, it stops because rates stop backing off uh, because the, the front end of the market is not moving and there's only so much steepness you can have at the current growth trend. Your thoughts on that, Robert, just how self-limiting a Treasury market sell-off could be? 
I, I agree. I mean, I think that you know, at some point, it's like, hey, oh, that's great. You have relief on the trade side, and, and the risk assets take off. And I think one of the limiting factors on equities has been, and you've seen this in Japan and in Europe, low rates don't necessarily bring you high equity prices, right? You're dropping the discount rate, but if your growth expectations are too moribund, you don't get the equity upside. So as we see the, the trade uh, tensions come down a bit, then you see equities uh, take off. But I think we just came through a period, I mean, when we talk about are you going to get a reacceleration, we just had the fiscal stimulus. Now we are coming into an election, are we going to get another tax cut? Uh, I don't know, but I was a little bit surprised at, at the rapidity with which the last one came through. Um, but if you're not going to get another tax cut, if you're not going to get monetary stimulus, I don't see where that acceleration is going to come from. And we've already priced the Fed out of the market. But, but uh, Robert, we are getting monetary st stimulus. It's called the expansion of the balance sheet, the non-QE, QE that is taking place in the marketplace. They can call it whatever they want. Why but is that a stimulus? Uh, well, it, it, is, it is stimulus. Uh, you know, if you expand the balance sheet by $60 billion a year, call it whatever you want. It is stimulus in the, for, for, uh, for its impact on, uh, on the various channels. Is it stimulus if it focuses just on bills? Well, so I, I think it is not stimulus if it just focuses on the bills if the curve is really steep and if the curve is steep because of term premium. Term premium is, again, non-existent. So if curve is steeper, it's because of inflation expectations far more than term premium. So in that regard, the impact of stimulus is going to be, uh, be minimal anyway because term premium is low, and that's what's unfolding. Well, I think it, you're right that we have had a sea change. I mean, if you rewind 6, 12 months, ECB thought they'd be you know, not only done buying, they could be raising rates, and the Fed was raising rates and rolling off their balance sheet. Bank of Japan has been kind of constant in reducing their purchases. Fast forward to where we are now, they are injecting liquidity at the Fed. They realize they have to keep up uh, with the liquidity needs, number one, the ECB is buying. And what we've seen when you have that liquidity injection is better risk asset performance and a steeper yield curve. Quick question on US duration. Have you been a buyer this week? I'm not going to comment on you know short term. And Sounds position, like you've been a buyer. <laughs> but uh, you know my my uh, my first order hypothesis right is your range is, has shifted to maybe one to two percent, and we are near the top end of that range. So I'll be watching to see. I mean I think part of the decent growth that we had was a function of the fact that rates were so low, and it was supporting the interest rate sensitive side. Now we've seen the rates come back up. You know, my guess would be that you are going to roll over around here. What would you say to that, Sam? The top end of this range is 2% for a U.S. 10-year. I mean, we actually think there's more downside risk, frankly, with the 10-year Treasury yield moving forward. I think the issue is the range of possible outcomes is quite wide. So we can pontificate about this idea that rates continue to go up. Frankly, it's equally likely that rates go down from here. It really just depends on how the trade news unfolds. The final word, Krishna. Well, so I think the reacceleration is unfolding uh, in front of us. The Fed is stimulating the economy. They we will have a trade deal, rates are going higher. Uh, they, the 2% the range will be pierced, if not before year, and pretty close to, uh, uh, pretty close after that.